look at this picture, you may notice the expansive blue sky or the seemingly endless sea of golden grass. Or maybe you're focusing in on the Rocky Mountains in the distance. What I notice when I look at this picture isn't what's there, but it's what should be there. And that's the bison. Many people, when they find out that I work with bison, one of the first questions they ask me is, what is the difference between a buffalo and a bison? Well, in North America, they're one and the same. We use both words to talk about this animal. Now, scientifically speaking, the name of this animal is bison, bison, bison. So yes, it's a bison. <laughs> We've got it. <laughs> And a true buffalo is in a completely different family. So that would include animals such as the Cape buffalo in Africa or the water buffalo in Asia. Yet, we still call this animal a buffalo because it's a term that Native Americans adapted when they were learning to communicate with the white settlers. So today I want to tell you a little story about the Laramie Foothills Bison Conservation Herd. They're a little herd that lives just north of Fort Collins. And it was established on November 1st, 2015, with the goal of preserving the genetics of bison from Yellowstone National Park. Now, to help you understand why that's important and what's special about this herd, I'd like to give you a little bit of background. So many people are at least vaguely familiar with the story of the bison. There was a time when tens of millions of these animals roamed the prairies, and they roamed from Canada all the way down into Mexico and from California all the way to the Carolinas. But in the 1800s, we nearly wiped out this species altogether, and that was mainly driven by the hide hunt and the efforts of the white settlers to tame the West. But fortunately, there were some ranchers who saw what was happening, and they took the bison that they could onto their ranches, they provided them protection, and then ultimately, they helped to restore them to parts of the country. And so as a result, today, we do have half a million bison in the United States. Now, most of these are in the commercial meat industry, but we do have 20,000 that are in conservation herds, which means that they are being managed for the preservation of the species. So by many measures, this has been a successful conservation project, but there is a twist. And that twist is that when the bison were brought onto those ranches for protection, some of those ranchers experimented with hybridizing bison and cattle, which means they tried to get them to breed together. And they did this because they wanted to infuse some of the hardiness of the bison into the range cattle of the, of the day. It was an experiment that ultimately failed. But the end result was that many of the bison that were used to repopulate North America have some level of cattle genes remnant in their DNA. Now, this level is very small. We're talking 5% of their genome or less can be traced back to cattle. So I wanted to make a good comparison. And many of you may know that we recently found out that those of us who have ancestors that migrated out of Europe and of Asia have some Neanderthal genes in us. So I decided to get my DNA tested. And I found out I am 2.8% Neanderthal. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, but maybe I can see it. <laughs> And all of this is to say, does having a little bit of Neanderthal DNA in me make me less of a person? I would say no. Does having a little bit of cattle DNA in a bison make it less of a bison? Again, I would argue no. But from a conservation perspective, it makes the few bison that manage to avoid having that cattle DNA in their background particularly relevant when we talk about preserving the species. So one of the herds that has managed to avoid breeding with cattle in its past is the Yellowstone herd. So this herd has a very unique history, and they are genetically diverse, which is critical for building strong and healthy populations. And right now, there are three to 5,000 bison in Yellowstone National Park. 
And this is important, that they have no cattle DNA, because this makes them a wonderful target for conservation efforts to preserve the species. But there is a problem. And that problem is this bacterium. It's called Brucella abortus. It causes the disease brucellosis. And it's estimated that nearly half of the bison in Yellowstone National Park are afflicted with this disease. And while it is not lethal for them, they can give it to other animals and other wildlife, and the other wildlife can give it to them. And then when they come into contact with livestock, they can give it to livestock. And for ranchers, this can be devastating. And perhaps more importantly, is it can be given to people. So there have been large efforts made to rid North America of this disease. And by and large, we've gotten rid of it in the United States. The last reservoir of this disease is in the greater Yellowstone area. So for the Yellowstone bison, that makes conservation efforts very tricky. So we have to be creative. And that's where the science comes in. So my specialty is in assisted reproduction. So I help animals have healthy and successful pregnancies. And we generate a lot of these. This is an embryo. It's seven days old. And most mammals look like this at seven days. And so I realized, after learning about the Yellowstone bison, that we have some tools that we can use to help produce healthy bison from the Yellowstone bison to help preserve those genetics. And we can get those genetics out of the park, which has been very difficult in the past. And we can do it using the science. So how do we do this? Okay, so we can take a bison that has brucellosis, that's positive for the disease, we can allow her to breed naturally, or if the right bull isn't available, we can provide some assistance. And if everything goes well, seven days later, we can collect an embryo from that female. And this is at a time when the embryo has not made a connection to the mother yet. It's still free-floating in the uterus. We can collect that embryo, we can put it into a healthy bison, and if all goes well, in nine months, we have a healthy baby. We can also do this on the male side. So we can collect sperm from bulls that have brucellosis. And we can do a cleanup on that sperm. And it's actually a kit that has been used to clean up semen from HIV-positive men in fertility clinics. And we can apply this same technique to these bison. We can do artificial insemination on females. And again, if everything goes well, in nine months, we have a healthy baby. And finally, we can also take sperm and eggs from bison that are deceased. And we can take these cells back to the lab, and we can create embryos, and we can wash the sperm and the embryos, depending on whether or not the male or the female was potentially infected with the disease. We can produce those embryos, and then we can transfer them into healthy females. And you guessed it, again, nine months later, we could have healthy babies. So as we went down this path of research, we realized, OK, we're, we're making babies here. OK, we need to do something with these. And we need to do something important, because they're very valuable animals. And so that led us to the establishment of the Laramie Foothills Bison Conservation Herd. And the four core partners are listed here on this slide. And the City of Fort Collins Natural Areas and the Larimer County Department of Natural Resources provided the land on which we could put the bison. And I think what's really significant about these two organizations is that they are supported by citizen-initiated taxes that, when put on the ballot, pass by margins of 82% in this community. And that speaks volumes to the environmental ethic of the people of this community, that they are willing to put forward the tax dollars to protect lands that make conservation projects like this possible. And then we have the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. And they provide access to the Yellowstone animals, those very valuable genetics. And of course, Colorado State, because of the reproductive work that we're doing. So on November 1st, 2015, we did release the bison onto a 1,000-acre pasture on Soapstone Prairie Natural Area and Red Mountain Open Space. And I love this picture. It gives me a joy. It takes me back to that moment when they came charging out of that fence and tore off across that prairie. It was their first taste of the prairie. But it's important to know that this project wasn't just and isn't just about finding the bison a new home. 
So we also took the opportunity through the One Health Initiative at Colorado State University to do some ecological studies as well. So we're looking at how the return of the bison impacts the land. So this is Dr. Leba Pechar and her PhD, PhD student, Kate Wilkins. And they're looking at not only the grasses and the abundance and the variety and how that may change with the return of this animal, but they're also looking at how it affects the other animals in the ecosystem. They're looking at birds and mammals and learning about how the bison can impact those species. In addition, we've partnered with the Denver Zoo, and we're doing some social science work as well. And that will help us engage people on the site to understand, does bringing back a charismatic species like the bison help them to reconnect to the landscape, to the animal? And how do they feel about it? Do they go out? Do they exercise more? And they're also talking to agricultural stakeholders because they want to understand how they feel. And that, on all of that together helps us to create a model for reintroducing these species in other places. And that might be other species outside of just the bison. And we've also been able to engage the Native American community through the Native American uh, Association here at Colorado State University. And so many of the members of that community came to the reintroduction, and they provided blessings for the herd and blessings for the land. And as a scientist, it's often um, difficult to avoid kind of getting that tunnel vision and focusing on, for me, making babies, making sure they're healthy, and you know, asking the right questions and learning something from it. And I kind of had to take a step back um, during one of these blessings. So we had some of the members of the Native American community come in and perform a cedaring ceremony. And that was to bless the bison and the transport of the bison from our campus to the prairie. And we did it in the pen where the bison had been living for the last year or so. And we all came into the pen and we moved the bison out of the pen so that they were in an alleyway that went around the pen. And they were behind me and I could hear them. They were they knew something was happening. I could hear the footfalls behind me, and they were agitated. They knew something was up. And at the end of the cedaring ceremony, some of the members began to perform the buffalo song with the big drum. And the moment they struck that drum and began that buffalo song, those bison stopped moving. And I turned and I looked, and all I could see were bison eyes peering through the spaces in the fence. I know these animals, okay? When they hear noises that they are not familiar with, that is not their typical reaction. They tend to become more heightened. And at that moment, I realized that this project isn't just about the science, it isn't just about the ecological work, the social work, but there is a cultural connection to these animals that is so incredibly important, and it helped me to refocus what this project really meant. So the bison have been on the prairie for about four months now, and I'm happy to report that they're doing well. They're learning how to deal with those prairie winds, which can be quite formidable. And they've also forged through their first winter. And we're, I'm happy to report that we are noticing that they are exhibiting behaviors of bison that would have been in the wild all of their life. So this lady was actually kind of using that sweeping motion with her muzzle to graze out in the, in the pasture uh, before I took this picture. So we're excited about the future. We hope that this herd will grow and be a seed herd for other herds. And what that means is that these animals as we move forward with this project, that we're going to be able to watch this herd grow. We will support it by helping it reproduce in the first years, but ultimately we want them to be strong and to, and to be healthy and to be able to reproduce on their own. So we're excited about the future. We're excited about where the bison will go and where the project will go. And I invite you to come out into the prairie and to reconnect with the bison and reconnect with the landscape and maybe reconnect with the past and the present and the future of this project and this herd and in this space. Thank you very much.